Okay, great. Well, so um, it's 732. I wanted to take this opportunity first to thank you all for being here today. Um, you know, we've been doing this uh, POCUS Collaborative now. I think we started back in April. So we've had several, several sessions since then. And it's been going really great. People have been very engaged and involved. So I just really wanted to thank you all for coming this morning. As a reminder, if you can please make sure to mute yourself um, after entering the session, that would be great. Uh, since Dr. Anderson has a lot of amazing things um, to share with us today, we don't want to um, you know, uh, distract him or get in the way of his presentation. So if we can, that would be really great. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to share is that we're all bringing our different perspectives and, and different um, experiences into point of care ultrasound. Some of us are, you know, just getting into point of care ultrasound. Others of us, like Dr. Anderson, are very advanced. So we just have to remember to be respectful of each other during this collaborative um, and, uh, you know, be willing to share our experiences with each other. The last announcement I wanted to make is back in November, everyone should have received a survey, um, especially our, our global partners should have received a survey um, about this collaborative to help, it's almost like a needs assessment for us to understand kind of what the needs were so we could adjust the collaborative accordingly. If you can, please look back to your emails from November and fill out the survey so that we have the information you need to really make this collaborative robust. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to um, throw out there is the next session that is coming up on January the 3rd. Um, doc and Dr. List is going to mention this again at the end, but um, if there is any partner of ours globally, if any of our colleagues um, uh, would like to present at that that January 3rd uh, POCUS collaborative session, that would be really great. It really is wonderful when we have um, folks from different institutions present, like Dr. Nath presented last month. It gives a uh, you know, a real window into the way that people are using point of care. It could be case presentations. Um, so we see what pathologies you're dealing with. It could be um, on a topic in point of care ultrasound. Uh, that's really helpful for us. And I think it really shrinks down our, um, our medical community so that we're in touch with each other. So please consider it um, if you have the bandwidth to do so. All right, so it's now 7.35. I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce um, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Corey Anderson um, is a lot of things. He is a, a mentor, he's a colleague, he is a real powerhouse um, educator. And one of the things, despite all of the accolades I'm gonna read to you that I really just, um, admire about Dr. Anderson is that his energy um, and his hunger for learning and teaching and educating is just insatiable. You know, it's just unparalleled. Um, I've, I've really never met somebody like him. So I'm super excited that he's uh, willing to give this talk here today. Dr. Anderson is a professor in anesthesiology. He's an adjunct pr professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle. And as you know, it's really hard to get those adjunct positions in a whole different department. So that says something in and of itself. Um, he is a pediatrician and an anesthesiologist who holds multiple patents. He's active in and passionate about pain management and regional anesthesiology. Um, hence the, the talk here today, um, especially as they relate to children. He attended college at Harvard University and then subsequently received his medical degree from Stanford University, where he trained in, in the medical scientist training program. He was awarded the prestigious Robert M. Smith Lifetime Achievement Award for his contributions to pediatric anesthesiology just in the last couple of years, back in 2021. Um, having developed an expertise in pediatric regional anesthesiology, Dr. Anderson used those skills to help create a POCUS curriculum at Seattle Children's Hospital. 
He is one of the founding members of the hospital's POCUS committee and has taught POCUS skills to both local nas national audiences, and I would say even globally. Um, in his free time, he is an avid tennis player and an amateur photographer who loves skiing, gardening, the Minnesota Vikings football team, which I know is true, and the Brazilian Flamingo um, football team. Um, he's coming to us here today from Alaska, which once again is the reason why, you know, I said his dedication is unparalleled. Um, and we just wanted to thank you, Dr. Anderson. Yay, Vikings, <laughs> for being here this morning with us. Sarah, thank you so much. This is just a, a big honor for me and um, really, really uh, love uh, talking to uh, folks about pediatric anesthesia, especially regional anesthesia and pain control. Um, I, when I was first asked to do this, I thought, hmm, I'm going to relate this to the uh, global uh, POCUS uh, group. And I thought, well, God, that's so easy. Uh, and basically, it's because folks who do regional anesthesia have a real similar skill set to those uh, who do POCUS in that there's so much cross-fertilization that I hope to ha have happen, but uh, the, the skill sets uh, really do overlap a lot. So um, be that as may, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, get started here and Please don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask uh, questions um, about what any of the things that I'm talking about. Uh, the uh, only thing is, is that I, the topic is so broad that I was not able to fit it all into, uh, you know, one presentation with the time frame that I've been giving, given. So um, I will talk maybe later on uh, in the year. Uh, about some of the other intermediate and advanced blocks, I've really completely left out the central neuroax neuroaxial uh, blocks just because of that. I'm concentrated on the peripheral blocks. This is how uh, many people think of uh, what we do as anesthesiologists uh, and that we just come in with our uh, big hammers and bop people on the head. Uh, surveys uh, taken back in the 80s uh, by the ASA showed that 80% uh, of the population that they did survey didn't even know that anesthesiologists had uh, MD. So uh, we're all hoping to dispel that. So the, again, the topic is going to be pediatric regional anesthesia today, uh, and then I really do have a passion for eliminating pain and utilizing those skill sets that uh, are not detrimental to the future of the uh, children. And so thus, regional anesthesia uh, decreases the amount of opiates that a patient needs to uh, have and uh, will uh, create a situation that is really conducive to healing. Uh, as far as disclosures go, I do uh, speak on a couple of speakers bureaus. Uh, those include the Avenos um, uh, Medical Incorporated, and I'll change that. The uh, I do eval evalu evaluations of uh, some of the machinery uh, for some of the uh, ultrasound manufacturers in the area, and then I don't have any major stock holdings. Neither does my wife. Uh, she does give me an allowance, about $20 a, a, a week. And I do save that to buy uh, his things. Anyways, the objective here is to understand closely, excuse me, how closely focus and uh, ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia are related. And again, I have to say the skill sets really do overlap uh, quite nicely. So those of you who do uh, POCUS and teach POCUS really would encourage you to just take in, um, think about the anatomy, uh, talk about the nerves and bony structures that are in the area to, to really help create a, a culture and a milieu where the uh, students uh, really feel comfortable and get, gain a great knowledge of anatomy, not just 
you know, focusing on, you know, what the function uh, is for that POCUS exam, but also a more global uh, nature in that. So I'm going to have you hopefully at the end of this, understand the relevant anatomy and approaches to ultrasound guided regional anesthesia uh, in, in children. And it described the, uh, some of the factors to perform uh, this, uh, these techniques safely and you know, just to make children more comfortable. Uh, as I said, uh, what, you do, what happens is, is that when you're doing your POCUS exam, uh, and your regional exams, you're really seeing the same uh, or similar anatomy uh, in that. Just changing and adjusting the depth uh, can be really helpful to see things uh, in that that you normally wouldn't be looking for. So for instance, this is just a, uh, a truncal uh, block. And when you're performing something like this, you do often see lung sliding uh, there. So you're really enriching yourself uh, in knowledge base with regard to not only the regional, but also uh, POCUS. And there's various places throughout the body that are just like this, where uh, folks can uh, see or are visualizing the same type of anatomy. So what are the, what's the skill set with regard to what uh, a, a person performing POCUS is in those performing regional anesthesiology? Well, uh, they have to be careful in both instances. You don't want to make the misdiagnosis, just like you don't want to stick the needle in the wrong place. I, of course, you have to have great hand-eye coordination. It's so important to be able to uh, know exactly where you're putting the needle uh, and how it's going to affect the uh, patient. A knowledge of the anatomy uh, and that safety first. Uh, of course, we don't want to do any harm to our patients. And we want to improve their quality of health with both of these techniques. And then, again, we want to protect our own selves and do things in an ergonomically um, a careful fashion and one that's going to uh, make it good for the patient and yourself. Uh, we often find ourselves moving around the table to perform uh, blocks to optimize our position to do that. And, and that. So managing the equipment and where it's put uh, is really rather important. Uh, Dr. Nikravan, when she was teaching uh, the faculty course on uh, ultrasound really emphasizes this, either sitting down, getting the patient at the right height, uh, putting the machine where you can reach it and you can actually view the screen uh, wherever it's going to be optimal. But it's something that you ha have to think about. We create, we have so much stress uh, on our bodies in that already just thinking about doing no harm to the patient making sure we get the diagnosis right. That's a lot to carry. Plus you put your body in odd positions or you're pushing machines around can be uh, quite uh, damaging to uh, one's uh, body. Well, we have a tool, really great tool that we can use uh, to uh, take and perform uh, blocks. This tool is for illustrating normal, abnormal anatomy uh, in physiology and to really make things very safe for the uh, patients. And, and that's in both cases. This is just demonstrating the types of things that one can evaluate uh, with the POCUS exam. And there are many corollaries or adjuncts that you can use those skills that you have, focus skills that you have to perform uh, many of the blocks that are needed to make uh, children comfortable, uh, either uh, in a therapeutic manner or to also use it in a diagnostic manner. I wanna remind you all that children are not just uh, small adults. Although they're very cute, 
uh, can dress up like adults. They really do have a uh, different anatomy and physiology in there. I will remind you, however, there are some adults that act like children occasionally. I'm gonna have to update this picture and, and put uh, Aaron Rodgers in there. And remember, I'm a Vikings fan, so I'm gonna change that. With the children, we, there are various sizes. And one day you can get a patient that is less than one kilo in the pediatric hospital in our practice. And then the uh, same day have a patient who is over 100 kilos uh, in that. So there's a wide variety of anatomy and physiology that we have to uh, take care of. With regard to this, the proportion of body, the proportional body uh, areas uh, change. For instance, uh, the, the head, as, as you know, is a very large component. Uh, it loses a lot of heat uh, in infants in that. And as we grow older, these proportionalities change. So the uh, representation of the, the how big the legs are, or how long the legs are, what proportion of the body surface area represents changes uh, also. There are other factors that change uh, with regard to the number of bones and that, that we have as infants uh, changes. Uh, I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago that uh, with regard to the number of bones that a child has, it uh, definitely, and it does make sense that they have more than many of the bones do uh, fuse. Uh, with regard to the bones it's, uh, themselves, ossification changes. This may change your view of what you're seeing uh, on ultrasound in terms of where you, where you place uh, the needle uh, in that. For instance, we often use an intracristine line to perform lumbar plexus blocks, but uh, in a small infant, that line uh, may change the total amount of muscle mass may adjust that line that changes the depth at which we uh, uh, may put the uh, the needle in the hand. And this is quite relevant when we're doing performing things like caudals uh, and again, lumbar plexus blocks. With regard to some of the uh, anatomy, um, as the child uh, goes, uh, 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 grows during the uh, uh, in, in utero, there are various physiologic things that uh, change. This is especially relevant to the uh, nervous system and with regard to uh, pain that's actually felt. And when I first started my residency, uh, there were lots of folks that felt that infants didn't feel pain. And it wasn't until the late 80s and that that uh, really a big hue and cry uh, came about from the medical uh, community and actually the general population with regard to uh, children do have pain and they deserve good pain treatment. So the take home message for that segment is that the large surface areas, they lose heat. Um, there are uh, changes that occur uh, anatomically uh, during the early stages of life until we get to a uh, more mature uh, area when you're uh, 14, 15, et cetera. You take on more of an adult physiology. Heart rate, respiration, metabolism, uh, oxygen consumption, uh, et cetera, uh, and that ch uh, changes. The uh, way that we actually metabolize the drugs that are given during regional anesthesia is also uh, a big factor that changes from infancy uh, to adulthood. This is because of the function of uh, many of the organs that we have, our liver especially. So with regard to uh, regional anesthesia, where, where are we gonna really start with all of this? Uh, and I would suggest, uh, besides having great knowledge of anatomy and your equipment, ergonomics and that, 
a real good place is to start with the, the, the surgeon. Uh, talking to her is so important to find out exactly what they're going to be doing. It makes a big difference on where they're going to be operating and where you're going to do your block. If you take a look at an area, for instance, the, uh, like the elbow or the knee, it's a quite a complex uh, anatomical um, uh, structure in that there are nervous inputs or nerve inputs uh, that come from a number of different sources. So blocking just one set of nerves, let's say for the superficial uh, skin or even for the myotomes may indeed not get you the kind of pain relief that you need uh, for that particular patient and the surgery. If the surgeon doesn't tell you that, well, they're going to be drilling down into the bone uh, in that you may perform the best block in the world to cover the superficial areas, um, the dermatones and myotones, but if you don't get the bone, then that's really a failed block uh, and nobody's happy about that. So you want to uh, do your block based on the anatomy. I would encourage you all to pull out your uh, anatomy books from medical school or one that uh, any of your instructors uh, suggest for you that are really um, good, that are show not only the different anatomical structures, but also the radiologic use of those uh, structures to help ingrain in your mind. This is your machine learning and collection of uh, data so you can take and mull it around and uh, actually utilize, utilize it. Uh, I really like this uh, photograph of the uh, dermatones uh, in that or depiction of the dermatones in that if you look at it in this position, which we've evolved from our uh, lower ancestries, uh, is that it's really an axial or large circles that are going around the body uh, in that. And that's the way the dermatomes really pro progress from one end of the body to the next. It makes it a lot easier to memorize rather than this uh, netter or um, other really sort of natural anatomical uh, depiction that you see in most books. Uh, it's hard to, you know, at least it was hard for me to memorize the uh, different dermatomes. This, this makes it a lot easier in that depiction. So with regard to things that are going to be discussed today, I'm going to again talk about some of the uh, beginning blocks or blocks for beginners and a couple of the intermediate uh, blocks uh, in that. And these difficulty is really based on the ease of visualization of the target, uh, identifying the different structures, technical aspects of performing the blocks themselves, and then the uh, risk and complications that are associated uh, with actually performing the block. Rated as uh, easy, interme uh, intermediate, uh, difficult, or high. And that I do want to point out on some of the slides here, there will be QR codes that you can take uh, a picture of and actually get the references for um, uh, some of the uh, material that I'm uh, presenting uh, today. If you need any other references or they have missed out on something, please don't hesitate to contact me. I will put the my email at the end of the uh, procedure. So this is uh, just a slide showing that the different, breaking down the different regions, peripheral versus central. I'm not going to be talking about central blocks today, but maybe later on you know, during one of the sessions. And then um, the level of blocks in the rating here, one, two, uh, three, et cetera. And that in the various blocks that, uh, are rated uh, as easy, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, some of the blocks that were not in the paper, the ones with the stars on them, are the blocks that I put in myself and rated them based on my experience with trying to teach these to uh, other folks. So again, I'm not belabor that. I'm going to start out with the upper extremity uh, blocks and just talk a little bit about a couple of them. I really like this uh, image here because it sh shows you uh, that the different levels and what the uh, structures look like uh, when you're actually doing the scanning. 
um, this is an area that is somewhat ripe in that uh, we often will look at uh, POCUS, uh, POCUS views for the air, airway, and we'll view actually the brachial plexus and its many uh, stages and then We'll even see parts of the uh, lung uh, in that. So I've gone from interscaling here to uh, the uh, superlayer uh, clavicular block. Uh, this is looking at the infraclavicular and the muscular cutaneous. And this one down here uh, is uh, looking at your uh, axillary block. And this is a more peripheral block here, which you would see uh, on ultrasound. Uh, in that the honeycomb structure in the middle is actually the median nerve that one can visualize quite easily with the uh, ultrasound, especially starting up near the, uh, the cubital uh, fossa, as opposed to down near the, uh, the wrist where you could get confused with the visualization of uh, tendons that look real similar. So the first block is going to be the supraclavicular block. This is a uh, really uh, nice block for upper extremity uh, surgery uh, or pain relief uh, in that. The nerves, the brachial plexus, are really compact at the point of near the clavicle uh, where you can visualize this often described as uh, looking like a bunch of grapes. I actually think it looks more like a dried lotus uh, flower uh, in that, which has not gained any popularity whatsoever, except for in my own mind. The uh, block is actually rather uh, easy uh, one to do because the compact nature of the nerves in the uh, area here, right, as they go under, the uh, clavicle uh, in that you can surround this with uh, local anesthetic and get a, a pretty good solid block. One of our fellows performing a block here, position of the patient, the head's turned to the contralateral side. Uh, this patient is actually uh, intubated. Uh, we do majority of our blocks with the uh, ch children uh, either highly sedated or under general anesthesia. General is what we do the majority of the blocks under. And uh, the view here, you can see the nerves as they're bunched together, a uh, needle coming in there. The next block is going to be uh, axillary uh, approach. This is the surface anatomy for the block. Uh, and then this is just depicting on one of the models uh, the different anatomy that you would uh, see. So down near the, in the axilla, as far up in the axilla as possible, uh, you're gonna be seeing the uh, brachial plexus uh, come through and it's, uh, landmarks include uh, the arteries and the veins, the axillary artery uh, and the axillary vein. The uh, picture here just depicts in the way that I like to uh, instruct how to do this block. And really, the needle should come from above as opposed to coming from below. Uh, I've seen people try to approach this you're limited by uh, your the table down here, a real hard surface in terms of uh, angulation in, in that. So uh, it, it was real similar to the uh, ilioinguinal block. Approaching it from the contralateral side gives you a little bit better angulation uh, and movement of the the degrees of the movement of the needle, degrees of freedom of the movement of the needle uh, are much greater uh, in that uh, direction. And this is what it'll, the block would look like under uh, anesthesia. You can see the artery here. Here's the needle coming in. Uh, and then we're uh, just injecting local anesthetic. It would inject at a, uh, multiple injections. There's a nerve bundle here, here, 
and then down over here. And this structure coming out here, just fortunate enough to catch the musculocutaneous nerve before it really uh, takes off uh, too, too greatly. So this is really high up in the axilla uh, in, in that. The um, same type of view can be seen with the infraclavicular block, but that block's a little bit more advanced and uh, will not be discussed uh, today. A couple of important points that I wanted to point to uh, make here is that many of the structures and nerves are surrounded by this real tenacious uh, tissue, connective tissue. And when you're doing your block, it's really uh, important to remember that the deposition of the local anesthetic around the nerve, uh, that you've got these connective tissue and it's gonna take a little bit of time to absorb through or transit through that, that tissue. If you can get within or underneath that elastic uh, or connective tissue and deposit the medication without getting intraneural, these are techniques that you have to practice a bit to, to do, especially for the uh, sciatic nerve and then the brachial plexus can often help with the uh, spread of the uh, local anesthetic. The next one uh, is gonna be the median nerve block uh, in that. And you might do this for uh, particular hand surgery. The uh, uh, kids or children don't often get carpal tunnel syndrome, but it does indeed happen. There may be ganglion or um, other uh, structures that need uh, operation. So you may need to pick out a specific peripheral nerve block like the median nerve, the radial nerve, or the ulnar nerve to uh, block for particular surgery. And you don't have to block the brachial plexus completely. The ultrasound here, you can see the uh, artery. And then the, in the center here is the actual nerve itself. The needle's coming in from this area up in here. A little movement from the patient. And the needle's advanced towards the nerve. and then with local anesthetic deposit. Could I next move to lower extremity blocks? The first one I'm gonna talk about is a lateral femicutaneous uh, nerve block. Um, we will often use this for muscle biopsies. Somebody uh, is thought to be M MH susceptible, malignant, uh, hyperthermia in the family, uh, or they had an uh, episode, so you made uh, uh, biopsy uh, this particular area, or there's harvesting of the iliotibial band for an orthopedic procedure, or uh, biopsying different masses, uh, tumor, uh, et cetera, in that. So this kind of uh, block can be very helpful to decrease the pain that the patient has in that area. I want to point out a little bit of the anatomy here. Uh, the lateral femucutaneous nerve lies uh, between the fascia, uh, fascia lana and the fascia iliaca. And it's in the uh, more in the periphery near the anterior superior iliac spine, which is depicted over here. So it's right in between these two fascial layers. It's really very tough to see this particular nerve because it's uh, of its size uh, in that, and it's the density doesn't make it as uh, the contrast with regard to uh, ultrasounds, uh, waves bouncing off, but the contrast is not enough to make it as distinguished as we'd uh, like. But uh, be that as it may, the nerve does lie in between these two fascial layers. So if you can see, actually see, your femoral uh, artery and then femoral vein, one then just 
goes more laterally and deposit local deposits a local anesthetic in between those two structures, those two fascia layers to get a, a nice solid block. And here's the fascia layer here, and then here, the needle's gonna be coming in from the uh, right side of the screen, right uh, here. And you actually try to get a little bit further out uh, to deposit the local anesthetic um, in between those two, two layers. This down here is gonna be your iliacus muscle. And that and this is a visualization of the block being performed. You can do it uh, in a number of different directions. You can do it uh, from the contralateral side, uh, from the uh, caudal area, or from the uh, ipsilateral side. You just have to uh, see the two fascial layers. With regard to the next block, this is a rather important uh, block to uh, know about and be able to perform for a number of different re reasons. The uh, breakage of the uh, femur, uh, knee repairs, pretty much any th uh, thigh or lower extremity, especially medial side of the extremity, uh, you're going to need to be able to block uh, this nerve. And it's actually not a, a hard block to do. Most of you will have put a um, femoral line in at one point. The nerve is uh, right in the uh, uh, same area. In that. We're fortunate that we have ultrasound to actually see below the skin and visit, visualize exactly where we need to go. Uh, we don't have x-ray eyes, but we certainly have the uh, ultrasound, which is non-ionizing can give us a real good visualization of that area. Again, with regard to the anatomy here, oftentimes uh, people will tell me, well, the nerve, femoral nerve is right next to the artery. Well, indeed it is next to it, but it's next to it and below, and also below the two fascial layers. In some of the anatomy book, books, and I'll show you images of this, the nerve is depicted right in this area in between the uh, two fascial layers, as opposed to being embedded on the iliacus muscle uh, and below the fascial iliaca. This is one of the... Uh, pictures or images that um, I found on the uh, web that actually doesn't depict the nerve in the right area, really should be below the fascia uh, iliaca embedded on top of the muscle. Again, uh, navel, nerve, artery, vein, uh, empty space, lymphatics, uh, et cetera. But uh, also the nerve is below. And this is some of the patholo um, uh, pathology uh, structure showing where it actually is located. And the nerve's right here. You can see the iliacus muscle here. And that's the nerve there. An ultrasound of the nerve block itself. And we pierce through the fascia iliaca. And you can see once the injection occurs, the nerve will more or less float in the local anesthetic. And you can see nicely how this fascia is really below the artery. The nerve that is right next to the artery is actually the genital femoral nerve. And then further out to the uh, periphery would be the uh, lateral femoral cutaneous. 
And that's going to be between the fascia lata and the fascia iliaca here. But this is a nice honeycomb view. Uh, the nerve, a nice view of the nerve, which is in a honeycomb in structure. If Lynn used nerve stimulation, you can see the patellar dance. Uh, and then that, that's just basically a contraction of the uh, muscles in this area that control the patella. This uh, young lady had a leg lengthening procedure. It was a rough procedure. Um, uh, the femoral nerve was blocked. Actually put a femoral catheter in her. She was uh, quite happy about it. And again, I don't know if this might, uh, I hope you can see this in terms of the, the patella actually moving here uh, with nerve stimulation. We don't have to use nerve stimulation uh, that much anymore with uh, ultrasound. Uh, I sometimes like to combine the two to make sure that the student really has a good grasp of the function of the, that they're blocking. Just throw in here that um, when one sees uh, vessels, the color on the Doppler uh, is not indicative of the kind of vessel that it might be, whether it's arterial or venous, because depending on the tilt, uh, the color will change. Uh, I remember this, or was taught uh, this concept uh, using the four letters, Bay Area, B-A-R-T, Bay Area Rapid Transit, so blue away, red towards. Next block that I'll we'll talk about is going to be the adductor canal block. And this block is uh, really an extension of the adductor canal, uh, which uh, is right a little bit below the uh, inguinal uh, ligament for the entrance and then uh, right above the knee uh, for the exit. So the number of uh, vessels and uh, also nerves run through that, the uh, uh, saphenous nerve. And then the vessels uh, would be the uh, vein and artery uh, that run through that particular area. It's a nice block, especially for any type of knee surgery. And that, and it, with this block, the pain relief extends all the way down to the medial malleolus uh, and the um, medial side of the leg. And depicted here that the you've got the femoral artery, you've got the vein, the sartorius muscle, uh, which changes shape as you move up and down the leg uh, in that but the nerve and the artery are, if you think of this as a boat, I have a little bit better picture uh, of it as a boat type shape, uh, right at the bottom of the uh, boat are going to be just lying your structures. And in this picture is depicted that the uh, nerve is more lateral to the uh, artery uh, in that. And again, there's some anatomy books that have it on the other side, but I, Getting the local anesthetic into the canal here, uh, it's extremely helpful. Uh, you can hydrodissect with uh, normal saline to try to not damage, uh, as you're going through, uh, damage some of the nerves of the vastus with the needle. Needle. And then here you've got the artery. We've got the needle coming right down, right below the sartorius muscle. And the nerve's going to be uh, in this area here, and you deposit your local anesthetic. And you can see the bone, the femur uh, here. Those are just structures that uh, one can look at and see you're at that right in the right er uh, area. 
want to just say a little bit here, sometimes when you're doing these blocks, you might see two uh, structures that are beating to arterial structure. The uh, other um, st structure is the posterior femoral artery, and that just is a takeoff of the femoral artery here. Uh, it used to be called the um, profound femoris. Another depiction of this adductor canal block. Again, the this is going to be the uh, on the inner thigh, moving the probe from the table up towards yourself. If you're standing on the side of the bed, you'll run into the gracilis first, uh, and then you'll see the sartorius. Uh, if you have any question, you can take and uh, extend your um, visualization up to the inguinal area uh, and, then, and then back down and you can see the femoral artery running beneath this uh, structure. The nerve is going to be typically on the lateral side right next uh, to the artery or right near the artery. We've got the vastus medialis and then the adductor longus uh, here on the longus on the medial side. And this is going to be more on top or the lateral side. And again, the sartorius. And this has been described as a, a bow type structure. And this is the bottom of the bow here. And the block, the areas we want to block is going to be are going to be near the bottom of that bow. So if you're going to be putting a catheter in for this, and that may or may not be. Uh, something that can be done in uh, every area uh, of the world because catheters take a lot more teamwork to uh, take and follow. But if you do put uh, catheters in, uh, one needs to ground up and have, this is a real sterile procedure. Fairly simple block to perform. And leaving a catheter in is just as if you were putting an IV and throwing a catheter through uh, an IV or a, some other vascular structure. We'll turn next to doing a sciatic block. This is one of the largest nerves in the body. And then it's really um, two nerves in one. The uh, tibial and the common peroneal uh, nerve are combined to form the sciatic uh, nerve. The uh, nerve itself uh, really is uh, L4 to S3 or S4 in some textbooks. Uh, and then it's rather large and surrounded by a really large amount of connective uh, tissues, making it uh, a little bit more difficult to have a quick onset for the local anesthetic. So depositing the local anesthetic and trying to surround the uh, nerve as much as possible is rather important. It actually takes about three nodes around here to cause an interruption of the uh, pain transmission. But with the amount of local that we tend to use for this block, you're definitely going to cover those uh, uh, nodes. Almost every millimeter of this nerve has been named after somebody. They've done a block uh, at various points. There's Labat and uh, Winnie and the Raj uh, technique for blocking this nerve. And when taken moving up and down, you can see you know, if you notice that the nerve was split uh, earlier when it started. I'll go back and show that. So the nerve split there and it's coming together there. And as you would move down here, it, it comes together. So another fairly easy block to perform can do this in a number of different, um, uh, with a number of different methodologies, lateral, uh, anterior, subgluteal, uh, et cetera.
Here's the nerve located in the center. We've got the biceps femoris. Needles coming in laterally. And then you'll see the injection of the, well, maybe not, but the injection of the local, the nerves get surrounded by the local. And you'd like to see that nice, uh, what we call donut type um, visualization of the locals going around. What do you see when you stimulate different parts of that nerve, being that it uh, has uh, multiple components, basically two nerves in one? You can, with nerve stimulation, actually see different movements depending on where that needle uh, is placed. Anywhere from plantar flexion to dorsiflexion, uh, and then eversion in, uh, in, in that. So nerve stimulation can be uh, quite helpful and you can uh, selectively block the uh, tibial and common peroneal. You can see them under uh, ultrasound. Because we do the ultrasound with the uh, ultrasound uh, coming from below, the orientation of the uh, picture is a little bit different where the top of the screen is actually the bottom of the leg. It takes a little time to uh, adjust that in some people's mind and make sure the needle is going in the right uh, direction. With many of the new ultrasounds, you can flip uh, the screen and actually make the uh, orientation such that it's 180 degrees and it really does match the uh, normal orientation you're seeing with the needle going in. Up is up and down is down as opposed to the opposite way. This is the needle coming in, nerve here. That's probably tibial because it's a larger one than the common peroneal. You can see the local anesthetic going in between. Also, there's a little bit of the um, that tough connective tissue that I was talking about here. So getting the local anesthetic a little bit closer and peeling away some of the connective tissue can be very helpful. You can see the local anesthetic, this dark area surrounding uh, the nerves. Got a little bit of a muscle injection there. Just reminding it about the tough, sorry, about the tough connected tissue. This nerve can also be blocked up in the subgluteal area. Scanning all the way up uh, the leg, you can see how the nerve uh, flattens out here from the nice sort of round or oval uh, type um, structure. Then uh, to this flat structure. Approaching the uh, nerve with the needle here. Your bony structures, things that you'll see are gonna be the uh, ischium and then also the, uh, one of the uh, tubercles. And then your injection of your local anesthetic and lifting up that sciatic. So if there's somebody's using a tourniquet and they you still want a sciatic block, you can do this in a the subgluteal area. So some of the complications that can occur with uh, regional anesthesia, both adults and uh, children. Uh, there are numerous ones, and hopefully we avoid all of these. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we do see things like kink catheters. The mo one of the most common thing uh, complications would be a failed block that one uh, sees, and that can be for a number of different reasons. The discussion with a surgeon 
uh, didn't occur or uh, he tells you the wrong area that they're going to be operating. Oh, I just want to extend the surgery or extend the incision. Or they drill uh, deeper into the bone or another part of the body that uh, they didn't tell you about beforehand. The, uh, the hematomas can occur. Uh, it's a bit rare to see a compartment syndrome uh, here, but we hear uh, discussion or have discussions with our orthopedic colleagues uh, all the time about leaving catheters in and doing blocks in a particular area of the limb because of compartment uh, syndrome. Uh, pressure sores and making sure that you pad. And then the thing that really uh, will scare folks are the uh, last because of the uh, association of really badness that occurs. Last is basically too much local anesthetic uh, in the wrong area. You can see nervous components such as seizures or cardiovascular uh, issues that occur with LAST. LAST in children, uh, we've changed our philosophy a little bit about this. Uh, in the past, it's been thought that uh, basically the uh, kinds of blocks that would cause this uh, we're a little bit different than what's been found out uh, now. Uh, with the investigation of uh, LAST, uh, has, has been actually uh, helped with the formation of the Pediatric uh, Regional Anesthesia Network, or PRAN. We've been able to collect a, just a, a lot of data uh, and get a denominator to really find out how frequent uh, different uh, problems occur. And uh, Bertoski's review of uh, last in the uh, PRAN death, which is now well over 100,000 patients, they found that instead of uh, the local infiltration or aperturals or pervertibles being the most common uh, places you uh, children have last, uh, it's been identified as a penile block in the caudals as la being the areas or types of blocks where uh, last is mo most common. The way to read this is that the uh, coloring here, the white, is that there is um, over or in a, a greater abundant amount of local anesthetic Basically, the recommended amount of local anesthetic was higher than it uh, should have been, is white. So there were, out of 31 uh, uh, cases Dr. Anderson, of Dr. Anderson, just letting you, uh, making sure you're aware of the time. Uh, we're we're okay. pretty much at time. Mm -hmm. Okay. It looks like 10 minutes. Uh, it's 8.30. Okay. The meeting is at 8.30. Oh, okay. Sorry about that then. I'll um, finish up here. Or, yeah. So with regard to this uh, last in uh, the Paran database happened most often with bupivacaine and then uh, penile blocks. Preventing this, you have to know the right amount of local to give. We have these charts that show the uh, amount to give on a per kilo basis. We also run through our checklist. And I'd like to refer you to this uh, um, prep, stop, and block. And to remind that lipids are really uh, helpful. So I'm gonna end it there uh, in that, and then um, go ask for any questions Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson, for a yeah. really excellent, thoughtful, comprehensive presentation. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, please remember to unmute yourself um, to be able to ask the question. Uh, Corey, thanks ever so much, Raj from Harborview. 
Um, just a quick hey, one. Uh, there is a there's a real reticence in adults to do blocks of sleep because uh, everyone gets very worried about last and the drugs ending up in the wrong place and nerve toxicity. But obviously, impedes that's the norm. Uh, how do you make it safer for pediatrics, and how can we learn for adult practice? Well, um, the big, the really nice thing about um, uh, POCUS or the use of ultrasound has made the accuracy of where we're placing the needle uh, much greater uh, these days. So that that probably in my mind is the number one thing to make it uh, safer. Um, as you can see, I had a segment uh, in the in the talk that I had to take out because of the length of, you know, awake or asleep. Uh, when they've uh, looked at this in the, in the past, um, and, and as you said, you know, in adults, it's a real no-no, but uh, ultrasound has made, definitely made it safer. The types of drugs that we're using uh, today, um, ropivacaine versus things like a titocaine uh, that are really, really highly bound uh, and that have uh, made this safer. And then also the amount of local anesthetic that you have to give uh, to get a good solid block is much less uh, in using ultrasound than, than it was before. I remember in my initial training, we would give uh, just a ton, 40 cc's for a brachial plexus blocking. Uh, that's how we block things with a nerve stimulator and 40 cc's you can block pretty much every part of the body with that amount uh, and that. But the PRAN anal analysis of the PRAN database uh, showed that the uh, patients who were awake were the ones that had more uh, problems than the ones that were uh, uh, asleep. I hope that answers the uh, question. Yes, thank you. Uh, and sorry, just one other question, uh, unless anyone else has one. Um, how do you, if you're intubating and ventilating a child, and then doing your block, do you reverse them so that you can use the nerve stim or you just don't bother with the nerve stim or how do you go about it? Yeah, we don't bother with the nerve. We do the majority of our blocks. It's mainly old farts like myself that use it for teaching purposes, but uh, the majority of my colleagues um, don't use nerve stim except for in uh, one block, one particular specialized block that we do, and that's the uh, lumbar plexus block. Uh, and it's the way that we do it at Seattle Children's. It's not done that way in a large number of places around the world. Uh, we use the nerve stem to take in, uh, make sure that we're in the right area and see the uh, uh, quad muscles uh, move. Uh, for our lumbar plexus block, we're approaching this deep advanced block from the back and trying to locate uh, this myriad of nerves, L or T12 uh, through L3 in the psoas muscle. It's not a compact group of uh, nerves like it is with the supraclavicular block or some of the other plexuses. They almost run in a naked fashion through the uh, psoas. So getting a nerve stim uh, in there actually makes our uh, makes our blocks uh, better, uh, at least in our own minds and that. But I will tell you that a lot of the uh, don't even use uh, nerve stimulation uh, anymore. Any other questions? I had one question for you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, thank you for the fantastic visuals for each of the blocks. It's just awesome to see it um, in practice as you show. Um, and for starting with ergonomics, that's such an important part of, of um, doing blocks. I appreciate that you mentioned that. Um, can you describe your approach to learning new regional blocks? It's an ever-evolving field for even those that do blocks on a regular basis. But um, 
for someone who's trying to learn a new block? What's what's your approach to doing that? I love that you asked that question, David. It's um, something, as you have seen uh, with, with me, uh, that I love to do. So it's, I'm totally into simulation. And uh, taking and doing scanning uh, for both POCUS and regional anesthesia, uh, you know, and you don't have to have a huge simulation center uh, to do this. You need a patient or a model uh, yourself. Uh, part of the uh, way that I learned how to do regional uh, with ultrasound was just when I was in the OR doing a long case, I would just take and scan myself in different areas of um, my own body or drag my children in or ask a colleague if they uh, would uh, let me scan them or they could scan me. So that's one of the big ways. We at the University of Washington are very lucky to have some really skilled uh, folks. This is when Michelle uh, was one of our uh, regional anesthesia fellows and she helped teach a class uh, to our residents uh, in that we hold these classes on a yearly basis. Uh, Dr. Nikrovan has uh, organized our state society and done uh, scanning sessions. Uh, this is particularly for POCUS, but the skills that you learn in POCUS really translate nicely to uh, the regional anesthesia. Uh, in addition, I'm a bit of a tinkerer and have built uh, different models. Uh, this is a, a silicon-based uh, model that where we're doing, it's a model of a, um, a, a sacral area where we have the uh, residents and fellows practice their ca caudal uh, in that. The uh, lights here indicate whether that space uh, I have some electrical wires uh, going through this uh, in that. Um, you know, that might, you might think, oh, that's going to take a lot of money to do that. And, you know, not everybody has a 3D printer, et cetera. You know, you don't really need a lot of that stuff. Uh, you can just uh, really use uh, some of the things that are around you in an everyday fashion, um, styrofoam, stuff that is being thrown away. Uh, I build things with tennis balls, uh, uh, et cetera. This is that same caudal model. And it, I don't know for all intents and purposes, it looks real to me, but you can practice your ultrasound skills uh, with performing a caudal block here uh, in that. But this is really just silicone. That's not a real person there. And then just lastly, just to show you, this is a, a sacral uh, a model of a sacrum that I built 20 years ago. Uh, I still have it. And all I did was to take some of the casting material and uh, just shaped it into a, a model. And then you can cover that with uh, um, plastic uh, in that or cloth. Uh, and then just have folks practice. We additionally have these different scanning sessions uh, for uh, our, our fellows and residents on that. We run a CA1 or an anesthesia resident uh, regional ultrasound uh, session every year for scanning. Notice the purple and gold here. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are two more questions that popped into the chat. Um, let me take Amos's question first. Um, the question is, in our setup where the access to ultrasound is difficult, what is your advice for some of us who want to perform regional anesthesia in pediatrics? The uh, biggest advice I would say is to make, make sure you uh, connect up with somebody who uh, has some uh, experience with doing, uh, doing these uh, blocks. The next thing is, is that you have access to many of the videos that are online. There's a usra.ca site, the Canadian site, 
uh, uh, in that that I think is excellent. Many of our fellows and residents use Nisora uh, in that. There are lots of YouTube uh, videos out there too. The next thing is, is that there's uh, several books that I would uh, suggest if you're into pa holding paper. I know lots of folks uh, aren't into that. Anymore. But um, the uh, uh, David A. Young's Regional Anesthesia mm -hmm. book is it's for both for adults and pediatrics. Sorry, you don't have a picture of this, but David A. Young, A U Y O N G. Uh, in his, I forget his uh, co-author's name from Duke, but uh, that book is just excellent. So uh, those things, and then getting yourself a nerve stimulator that functions uh, in that, and then start with the simple blocks, uh, like a median nerve block or the axillary block, and see exactly you know what the function of the nerve is. They, again, the children need to be asleep. Um, you need to make sure that you've got the full setup in terms of uh, oxygen suction. Um, I would recommend that you have lipids around in case there was a last uh, issue. Uh, and I would admit working at uh, places where you can get a hold of a vial of lipid, this stuff lasts for years. So uh, one, one bag uh, can be useful and, and last for a long time. But, and then talking to uh, folks like uh, Dr. Liston um, or Dr. Ojo uh, in that who are highly skilled in uh, performing these things. So. I would, I would, those are, that's what I would suggest. Uh, sometimes the companies are willing to give you a discount on uh, used ultrasound machines. Um, I, I was able to uh, find a couple old ones that were being just standing in the corner and uh, gave one to the simulation center. And then um, uh, Aruna, I forget, um, who she sent it to, but we gave gave away one to one of our uh, partners in that. That was so, Cure. Yeah. That was the Cure Hospitals. She um, she sent it to. I'm sorry, Bookie. Uh, Doctor Kamath, Doctor Kamath sent the ultrasound to I think Cure Uganda or Cure one of the Cure Hospitals. Oh, fantastic! Then uh, that it came from me, but I had it around it wasn't being utilized as much as it should have been so give it to somebody that could use it haven't heard back if they if it's been useful or not and there is uh there's one final question in the chat as well um from temitope Owaniwa. she says thank you for the presentation uh which approach to lower limb block do you prefer fascia iliaca block or individual nerves for the lower limb uh, good question. Um, are several blocks, the lumbar plexus block, the supraingual fascia iliaca block, the um, you know subinguinal fascia iliaca block. There's the new pain block. Um, the individual nerves. So it really depends on where the injury is, where is the pain going to be? How much coverage uh, do you need? What is your skill level? I'm not gonna recommend the lumbar plexus block to very many people. You need to really gain a lot of skill before you do that. So the superinguinal block with enough volume can give you a similar kind of coverage you may miss the obturator uh, nerve, which is important for the hip and uh, also the knee. They do send little uh, twigs out to those areas and if they're missed can cause severe pain. But it really depends on where you, the surgeon's gonna be uh, operating or where the pain is, where the trauma was uh, for the patient. So my recommendation uh, it's really going to be based on a number of different things. Excellent. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there.
we will have to have you back again to um to have more of your knowledge shared with us and um we would appreciate uh anything you would do in terms of of um educating us on on potentially more advanced blocks next time as a few well, i'm sorry okay. that's, yeah, that's thanks, fantastic so. Yeah, I want to just show you lastly, this is a picture I took the other night up here in Alaska. That's why I came up here to look at the northern lights. That's a beautiful picture. But thanks again, this has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, I also want to use this as a plug for people to please fill out the survey that we sent out that uh, mentioned by Dr. Nick Ruvan. Um, It would help us to understand the collaborative better and um, hopefully tweak our initiatives and so we can apply for grants for some of the uh, questions you guys have um, you know, asked Dr. Anderson. Perfect. And all of our presentations, as a reminder, are archived and freely available on our YouTube channel. That link is disseminated in the monthly emails that you receive inviting you to these presentations. And our next focus presentation will occur on Wednesday, January 3rd. We hope to see everyone